Season 4 of Dragonflight is underway, and you've all been running keys like crazy. Despite a few bugs at launch, the vibe online is pretty good. It's still early in the season, but the meta is slowly coming into focus. So, while we give our major tier list a few more days to cook, we're going to highlight the specs that have been crushing the meta early on. And if you're looking for the best place to climb IO this season, Skillcapped has you covered with our rank up guarantee. Join today for instant access to hundreds of our famously effective guides that we only produce alongside the world's best players. And remember, a single subscription gets you covered for all of our games. So what are you waiting for? Click the link below to hit your goals this season and get the rating you've always wanted. Despite some recent nerfs, Vengeance Demon Hunters remain the dominant tank in Keystones. Vengeance Demon Hunters define the tank meta. Routes in Season 4 will be determined based on what Vengeance Demon Hunters can do, and all other tanks will be judged against that benchmark. It's also clear that we're going to see another caster meta like we saw back in Season 2, which means that Chaos Brand is damn near essential. The control Vengeance brings is unparalleled. With it, Vengeance is able to carry these massive pulls that are a staple of Season 4. Their control is matched only by their survivability. That ability to control 10 mobs is useless if you can't survive, but that is absolutely not a problem for Vengeance. Like Blood Decays in Shadowlands, Vengeance relies on maintaining high avoidance for its survivability, and just like that build, Vengeance is most vulnerable in the first few seconds of a pull, particularly when gathering multiple packs. Vengeance is also known for its threat issues. Grabbing Ads that spawn mid-combat can be a real challenge, and unfortunately, ads spawn all over the place in Season 4. It's easily the most frustrating part of playing this spec. But as it stands, the tank participation numbers make it clear that Vengeance has a stranglehold on the meta. It is the tank to play in Season 4. Archon's data aggregator is illustrative here. As far as it's concerned, it goes Vengeance and then everyone else, and that captures the spirit of Season 4 beautifully. Every tank is good, but Vengeance is exceptional. A competent Brewmaster Monk or Blood DK can succeed, but the only reason to pick up one of these tanks is because it's your tank. You've always been a prot warrior, you're damn good at it, and you'll do whatever it takes to avoid being assimilated into the Vengeance Demon Hunter hordes. Moving on to the melee DPS, Outlaw Rogue has continued looking great in Season 4, after dominating the meta in Season 3. What makes Outlaw so good is ultimately just its raw damage, but its utility is nothing to sneeze at. Its personal defensives are among the strongest of any melee. It brings an AoE stop with the recent addition of Airborne Irritant, and of course, Shroud of Concealment. Outlaw is undeniably a great spec, but it's interesting how easy it is for us to criticize it. For instance, the target cap on Blade Flurry is a well-known weakness. For all the big flashy pulls in Season 4, dungeons are ultimately defined by pulls under 8 mobs and by single target boss encounters. Outlaw's target cap is far from a deal breaker. The same can be said for Outlaw's stat scaling. The spec only values two of the four secondary stats, so Outlaw isn't going to scale well in Season 4. That's a flaw. Will it matter? Too soon to say. Outlaw also hates playing with AUG Evokers, who at time of writing are mandatory in the highest level keys. But we're all fair weather friends to AUG Evokers, we don't actually want them in the groups if we can avoid it. That all sounds bad, but would we bet against Outlaw? Absolutely not. Outlaw is built to do well in keys, and no matter how much the odds are stacked against it, it's going to find a way to hang around the meta. Retribution is set to be enormously successful in Season 4. Paladins are best known for their utility. Devotion Aura remains a significantly underrated buff in Mythic Plus, but is a real nice to have with the amount of AoE damage in this dungeon set. 60 second Blessing of Sacrifice is huge to help your tank deal with all of the tank busters. Cleanse and BOP are nice to have on the table, and as we saw in the most recent MDI, Ret can contribute quite a bit of off healing if required. Their damage profile is perfect for high keys, with explosive 60 second damage windows and uncapped AoE. It's to the point that it looks weird to see Retribution anywhere other than number one on the damage meter. I don't know man, it just doesn't look right. Retribution is typically held back by a need to play either an AoE build or a single target build, but by porting out of the instance and changing talents, Ret can have their cake and eat it too. But you should know that Ret is reliant on the Fire Act Legendary to be viable. While this may be frustrating, the reality is that specs are balanced with these legendaries in mind. Our consultants wouldn't bring a Ret Paladin to their keys without the legendary weapon. This means that Retribution may not be an ideal candidate for you to pick up as a brand new character in Season 4, but outside of that, we are still awarding Retribution with the coveted skill-capped, most likely melee to succeed trophy. 
You may be expecting Arms Warrior or Unholy DK to get mentioned, and while both those specs are solid enough melee, this video is about choosing your main, and we aren't going to leave you high and dry by recommending a bunch of melee that need to farm the Farrakh Legendary. Instead, you should play Windwalker Monk, who are flying under the radar right now, but are very good. So, why Windwalker? Windwalker's AoE is mostly uncapped, which is a huge benefit in Season 4. The spec is built around 2 minute burst windows with Schwen. Outside of those windows, Windwalker relies on random procs to put out decent damage. This is a well known flaw in Windwalker's design, but RNG can go both ways. Sometimes your damage sucks, and sometimes you get lucky and randomly become a god. Windwalker pulls its weight in the control department with Leg Sweep and Ring of Peace. Tiger's Lust is also a very underrated piece of utility, allowing you to remove certain debuffs from teammates or help your plotting teammates get out of the group before they explode. Windwalkers also bring a ton of personal defensives, so they always have something for those AoE burst phases. Ultimately, Windwalkers are going to be melee stack specialists, building compositions around maximizing Mystic Touch. It pairs beautifully with something like Outlaw Rogue or Arms Warrior. Windwalker is not going to be the guy, but to use a sports metaphor, by going with Windwalker Monk over arms, you're getting the same second round talent with a third round pick. And how can you say no to that? Now to the range DPS. If a god comp is going to exist in season 4, it's going to come down to which combination of these casters ends up making the squad. In Season 2 of Dragonflight, Aug Evokers were everywhere. They offered a net damage bonus over any other DPS, as well as enormous amounts of control and defensive utility. Season 3 nerfed Augment's damage contribution, seeing the spec become most valued for its defensive support. It's the spec you bring if living is your top priority. In our Season 4 predictions video, we covered how Augmentation Evokers will either feel mandatory at the highest level of keys or be non-existent. And unsurprisingly, they've landed on the mandatory side of things in Week 1. For the time being, they are the obvious standout for ranged DPS. But given that plus 10 keys already feel kinda chill in Week 1, we don't expect Augmentation to be at all necessary for keys in that range. But don't panic because we also told you to expect Devastation to be the real deal in Season 4, and even from under the shadow of Augmentation, Devastation has made itself seen. Devastation brings a lot of the utility that Aug brings, but trades out the defense and some control for raw damage. Single target is the biggest draw card, but Dev's AoE is respectable as well. Given how good Evokers look this season, there might be no faster way to farm battle tags than to learn to flex between Augmentation and Devastation. Sangelios is a great example of that. This week we saw him go from dealing top damage as Devastation in Brackenhide to helping his group survive through no could on Augmentation. This is how we expect Evokers to behave this season, flexing between Aug and Dev as circumstances demand, the best of both worlds. Ultimately, we still believe in the Devastation dream. We want to see Augment slowly fade into irrelevance as Season 4 progresses, but if you want a character that will be a sure thing, Evoker is the way to go. Keep in mind that Evokers like Retribution have a legendary that they will need to acquire. It could be argued the Evoker weapon isn't as mandatory as the Firek weapon, but let's be real, you need it. Next up, Shadow Priest. What? Don't act so surprised! Despite all the nerfs and changes, Shadow Priests have been a staple of high keys for the last year. Even before they achieved Divinity in Season 2, Hype Boy was putting Shadow Priest on Raider.io's front page in Season 1. This is because Shadow Priest's utility has been so consistently strong. Vampiric Embrace is a group-wide defensive cooldown purpose-built for dungeon boss fights. Mind Soothe is overpowered as hell, and there's a good argument that it's a better overall tool for routing than Rogue's Shroud of Concealment. Mass Dispel was heavily nerfed in Season 3, but in some cases it is impactful enough that its 2 minute cooldown feels justified. And then of course, you have our old friend Power Infusion, one of the strongest cooldowns in the game, and an ability that can truly be regarded as meta defining. Oh, and even Power Word Fortitude is a big deal, can't forget that 5% extra stamina. Combine all this support with Shadow's own strong personal defensive toolkit. And you have one of the most useful specs in the game. But don't misunderstand me, when it comes to the damage meters, Shadow is no scrub. With the return of Shadow's Season 2 set bonus, Shadow Priest's AoE and single target output are among the highest of any spec. Shadow loves these lengthy 10 plus trash pulls, spreading vampiric touch and spamming out shadowy apparitions. But this exact same build can also compete with the highest single target damage specs on boss fights. At time of writing, Shadow is the ultimate DPS in Mythic Plus. Destruction Warlock is yet another caster DPS that is ridiculous in Season 4. This season, Destro's big appeal is its AoE damage on large pulls, which is arguably the highest in the game. 
While it is worth remembering that Destro needs these big pulls to put out such impressive numbers, its AoE on smaller packs and even its single target damage remains very good. Destruction is by no means a one-trick spec. Destro's archetype is built around passives like Flashpoint and Prepared Time, which both front ends the Warlock's damage and rewards them when adds spawn during combat. And as you'll remember, that this season is lousy with mobs and bosses that spawn adds. Beyond its damage profile, Destruction provides plenty of utility. Health stones are hugely valuable, Imp Dispel is as useful as ever in Season 4, Gateway can assist the group in all sorts of ways, even Curse of Tongues has its uses, and in a meta where survivability is such a big concern, Warlock's tankiness is a huge benefit as well. All in all, Destro is good in the way that Warlocks always are. They bring massive damage, immortality, and health stones, but as luck would have it, those three things make them successful in Keystones. To round out our range section, we have mages. Now, in our predictions video, we were very dismissive of Frost and Arcane for the purposes of brevity, but man, was that a mistake. In week one, we've seen Frost and Fire mages essentially neck and neck at the top end of the ladder. We'll cover mages generally before talking about each spec. Mages across the board have enormous amounts of utility. They bring three potential AoE stops, among the best of any DPS. Likewise, between Ice Cold, Greater Invis, Mirror Image, Alter Time, and Mass Barrier, mages have among the best defensive toolkit of any DPS. In a caster meta, Arcane Intellect might as well be considered mandatory. Even Mage Food is low-key overpowered. It's crazy. If any class can be considered overpowered in Dragonflight, it's mages. So when it comes to picking a mage spec, it's a matter of what flavor of overpowered you're in the mood for. Again, for brevity, we're going to skip over Arcane, so watch it become the best spec in a few days' time. Fire Mage currently looks and feels bad in Season 4, despite actually being insane. In a way, they're victims of their own success. Combustion used to be one of the most bursty cooldowns in the game, but Dragonflight's talent tree leaned into it too hard, creating an entire archetype around the ability. It gave Combust a ton of additional buffs, cooldown reduction, and procs, with a lot of this stuff compounding off each other. This has led to combustion uptime creeping up as the expansion has progressed. This essentially means that combustion isn't allowed to be powerful anymore. Instead of being a 10 second buff every 2 minutes, it's up to 30-50% to 50 of the time. Combine that with Fire's traditional ramp up time and it's no wonder that specs like Destruction and Retribution are mogging them on pulls like this. But because Fire Mage spends so much time in combustion, it has become the damage meter equivalent of the Terminator. While Avenging Wrath or Void Eruption need time to reset, time to sleep, combustion never stops coming for you. Fire does better the longer encounters drag on, punishing it in lower keys but rewarding it in higher keys. Now to Frost, which received an exciting rework in 10.1.5, but despite looking so good on paper, the spec just wasn't delivering on the leaderboards compared to Fire. But in Season 4, Frost is benefiting from the larger pull counts in this dungeon set, which regularly allows the mage to get settled and pump out frozen orbs on packs of 10 or more mobs. Frost Mage also has the kind of stat scaling that you want to see in Season 4, with all stats being valued. And this is all happening while Fire is looking a lot less sexy than it did at the end of Season 3. The window is open for Frost to contend. At time of writing, Frost Mage representation above plus 10 is about half that of Fire. In theory, it looks like Frost is the future. Fire isn't going anywhere, but there are some things it can do that Frost simply can't. But Frost is in arguably the best position that it has ever been. The best mages are expected to be flexing between Fire and Frost, but Frost is strong enough that you can pick and stick if that's your preference. Listen, we're putting the finishing touches on this video, and I just wanted to sneak in and just quickly say that, you know, Destro Lock, great, Mage, great, forget all them, play Elemental Shaman. It looks like so much fun right now to play uh, an Elemental Shaman in high keys. They have this whole AoE system built around spreading flame shocks and, you know, getting the whole, like, multi uh, lava burst thing going for them. They, they're a bit squishy, as everyone knows, you know, they're not sexy, as everyone knows, but they look like so much fun and are and, uh, doing really well right now. So that's our actual recommendation. Like, yeah, play the meta, sure, but if you want to have fun and do well, Elemental Shaman. The carry potential of some of these range specs is absolutely enormous. Right now, whether you are wanting to learn the fundamentals or master some advanced concepts, we've designed everything on our website with one goal in mind, to make sure you can hit your goals faster than you ever thought was possible. Sounds too good to be true, right? Our famously effective guides are designed alongside WoW's best players, even from the number one guild in the world, seriously. And if you are a skill cap member, players like Mirrors from Echo can even review your gameplay and provide personalized tips while teaching years worth of game knowledge into a single VOD review. 
We know your time is valuable, which is why we back everything up with a rank of guarantee where we promise you will improve while using our service. So if you want to save time and avoid frustration, be sure to visit the links below to get the rating you deserve. Anyway, back to the video. Finally, let's wrap up with our recommendations for healers. There's this interesting quirk with Resto Druids. They are one of the simplest healers to understand conceptually. You press buttons to apply heal over time effects to players. Because they're so easy to understand, new menders will gravitate toward Resto Druid, believing it to be the easier healer. It's only after they start pressing buttons that Resto Druid reveals itself to be the most difficult healer to actually play. But the results speak for themselves. Resto Druids have dominated the first week of Season 4. Though this may be less to do with the superiority to druids over everyone else, and more a matter of convenience. Mark of the Wild is regarded as the single strongest group buff, and this season Resto Druid is the easiest way to slot that buff into a meta comp. Incap Roar is among the best AoE stops available to healers. Ursal's Vortex has a lot of great applications, and Soothe doesn't get the wraps that it deserves. Resto Druids have a very limited kit of throughput cooldowns and rely on pre-hotting to get through high demand periods. This makes life a lot harder for them, but offers them a flexibility that few other healers can match. They can just heal harder as the situation demands. However, this also means that they don't like surprises. Every Resto Druid has a plan until their Shadow Priest gets punched in the face. So as impressive as Resto Druids may look, they may not be the strongest option for players looking to purely pug keys. In the absolute top of the meta, Resto Druids have been dominant, but unlike Vengeance Demon Hunter, they aren't bringing anything game-changing that forces you to bring the Druid. So that is why we believe that in spite of very scary numbers on the data aggregators, other healers will continue to thrive. The safest example of this would be Mistweaver Monks. Mistweaver was meta in keys for the first time ever in Season 3 of Dragonflight, and while they have received several nerfs between seasons, they're continuing to perform. Blizzard has been slowly shifting the focus of Mistweaver entirely towards fistweaving. This means that Mistweavers don't get to hide in the back line. They need to punch the villains in order to heal, allowing smart healing to drive the majority of your healing output. This makes them the polar opposite of Resto Druid. While Resto Druid is simple to grasp, but nightmarish to execute, Mistweaver can appear very daunting at first glance, but quickly reveals itself to be the easiest healer to pick up. If you approach Mistweaver like a DPS spec, it should feel quite natural. Mistweaver has an array of short throughput cooldowns that help it deal with bursty damage. Mystic Touch makes Mistweavers an ideal healer for melee stacks, but their interrupt can also be a very valuable addition to caster comps that would otherwise be lacking in the kick department. Mistweaver is a spec with real carry potential, making it an excellent choice for pug runs. All this makes Mistweaver once again a very potent healer in Mythic Plus this season, and our recommendation for anyone looking to pick up a new healer this season. Like many of the other specs today, you can get started on both of these healers right now on skillcap.com. And no matter what class you play, we're here to make sure you can hit your rating goals and improve faster than you thought possible. So check us out using the exclusive discount links below. Alright guys, that wraps it up for this one. Be sure to let us know what you think in the comments below. We want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.